Okay, we are live. Hello. Um, hopefully my sound is working. That's how every stream is going to start because I am now paranoid and I have this little superstitious behavior where I have to check my mic every single time and make sure that it's set correctly because half the time it hasn't been, uh, even though it displays correctly. So, hi everyone. Um, well, uh, last week I talked about the fact that I had a bunch of materials on order and the reason I wasn't making some of the stuff for my actual big costume projects was... Uh, because my materials hadn't arrived. So I currently have materials on order for seven different costume pieces. Uh, I checked all the shipping today. They're all still in transit. So we are not making a new thing today. However, uh, we are going to be doing a bit of show and tell. Um, so, you know, the, the beautiful thing about having sort of a flexible open program is I can just change topics last minute if I don't have one specifically advertised or planned. Um, so uh, I, I put out a call for, you know, what do people want to see? What do people want to hear me talk about? And I did get response from uh, Grace, who said she wanted to see some show and tell about one of my big, fancy, elaborate costumes and have me show it and show how I made stuff. Uh, and how I did the various parts of it. Um, the one she suggested was Marguerite. Marguerite currently doesn't live at my house. Marguerite is, I think, in Lara's attic right now because it's kind of big and elaborate and hard to store. And as I may have mentioned, my sewing room is a little bit small and doesn't have uh, storage space. So uh, I don't have Marguerite, but I do have uh, part of our Dirk Gently costumes. Um, those are the ones we made in 2018, I believe, for uh, Dirk Gently's Holistic Te Detective Agency. <laughs> Everything's connected. Laura's way ahead of me. Um, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, which uh, was a, a book, two books actually, that I read when I was a kid. My mother was a Douglas Adams fan, so we always had the Hitchhiker's Guide books and everything around the house. And I had read uh, the original books back in, gosh, the early 90s. Um, and then I heard the TV show was coming out, but I was a little wary because it's hard to do Douglas Adams well. Um, and I didn't actually watch it until I heard Samuel Barnett was in it, who I knew from another program. Um, he played Norton Folgate in the Big Finish Torchwood Audio Dramas, which is a fabulous character and a fabulous portrayal. So I said, oh, well, if Samuel Barnett's in it, then I'm going to watch it. And uh, fell in love with the show. Absolutely amazing show. Watch it if you haven't. Um, but we decided we were going to do costumes from it. And at Specifically, I started making one of the costumes, and then Laura swiped my costume uh, because we have a tradition that she gets to wear all the uh, red and black costumes, and I was making Queen Susie's gown, and it's red and black, so she said, well, I want to do that one because it's red and black, so I picked a different character, which was fine because there are a lot of great characters in the show. Um, and Kate says, it's a series of tubes. Yes, no, but yes, but no at the same time. Um, so what I'm going to do for uh, today's video is we're going to show some of the costume pieces from that costume set. I'm going to talk about the process and show some of the details that maybe you don't actually get to see in photos. And in fact, there are very few photos of these costumes because we've only worn them twice. I think I've worn the Litsy Bits three times, actually. Um, and we've never done a photo shoot in them. So we just have like a couple of cell phone photos of them, which is a shame because these are some of the costumes I am proudest of out of everything we've made. They have an incredible amount of detail. I did a ridiculous, absurd amount of research and detail matching when making them. So I want to talk about them because it's cool. Um, so without further ado, let's start with Litsy Bits Trust, one of the Scissors Cowboys. Um, these costumes are from the second series of Dirk Gently. So sort of weird childish fantasy fairy tale by way of a lot of crack. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's hard to describe series two of Dirk Gently, but a lot of it takes place in a reality that isn't quite real. And it's all very uh, inspired by fairy tales and children's stories. So you have a lot of symbolism that shows up in the costumes. You have a lot of uh, period garments that show up because it's something that is rooted a few decades in the past. Um, so the first step, of course, when you're doing any costume is to get your reference images. Uh, since there were not many reference images available for these characters because they only show up in a few episodes, I sat down with my Blu-rays and took well over a hundred screen caps off the Blu-rays of my character. And I had, at one point, I had the binder some, somewhere, I don't know where it is, that actually has all of my references in it just so I could show them. Um, 
but I took a whole bunch of screenshots of off the disks and started organizing them and you know figuring out exactly how things are put together. The beauty of doing costumes that are rooted in TV and movies is if you can get good enough references, you can figure out exactly what they're using, and sometimes you can match the exact materials, which is something that I was able to do, actually. Uh, I tracked down the fabrics that they had used in Susie's gown and found the exact screen-used fabrics from a fabric warehouse. One was in New York and one was in L.A., and I got, like, the last scraps of these fabrics uh, that were for sale in the country uh, and managed to use them in the dress, so yay for accuracy. Um, it took a lot of sorting through the internet, but it was worth it. Um, so once I had my, my images, I started breaking down what the costumes were built out of. And the costume designer had elected to do a lot of things that were sort of inspired by vintage, like 1970s fashions, because of the era in which the the dream sequence type fantasy reality is happening. And so I happened to uh, have picked up the previous year about, oh, I don't know, eight or 900 uh, vintage sewing patterns. Um, I hang out on free cycle a lot. I, f I like free stuff and I'm inherently cheap. So somebody put up that their, uh, their grandmother had passed away and they were giving away all of her sewing patterns and she had spent 50 years making clothes for her family. So I drove across town with my Jeep and loaded up boxes and boxes and boxes of sewing patterns. And so I pulled out a whole bunch of vintage 60s and 70s sewing patterns and started looking for anything that was similar in cut or shape or, you know, if it had a placket like the shirt or anything like that. Uh, and I found, you know, these these things are delightfully hideous. Um, and I have two filing cabinets full of them. So if anybody ever needs hideous 1970s patterns, I'm your girl. But uh, I think I ended up using this one um, for one of the shirts. You can look at those beautiful bell bottoms there because uh, it had the placket and the correct collar. And then this one I used more more of as an inspiration. I didn't use the exact pattern because the shape wasn't quite right, but similar for the vest. Uh, and then the undershirt, I think I used, which one was the undershirt? I think I used this one for the undershirt. Another beautiful 1970s design there. Um, and I started making mock-ups based on these patterns. A lot of these were either uncut or still more or less complete. And so I was able to make fairly complete mock-ups and then modify them to match uh, the garments that were in the show. Now, because it was a TV show and because these were mostly side characters and they didn't need five identical hero costumes, um, one thing they had done is they had just acquired some shirts, for example, and ripped the sleeves off of them or, you know, used commercial clothing and modified them. And I couldn't get those original clothing pieces. So I actually had to do a little extra work to recreate the original clothing pieces to make them look like they had ripped the sleeves off a shirt. Uh, and this blue uh, undershirt is one of the examples this shirt was originally just a blue pinstriped Oxford shirt in the show that they had torn the sleeves off of. And you could clearly see in the screenshots where they just cut the sleeves off a commercial shirt. That shirt was not available to me. So I hunted down some, um, some shirt weight twill that had a pinstripe fabric or a pinstripe pattern. And then I did about a week of dye testing to try to match the color. And I have in my, in my judging binder for these costumes, which I think I showed the first or second week of January, uh, I, I did a stream where I talked about breaking down costume parts and, and showing things, and I showed some of that. It was probably probably in the replay somewhere. Um, and I actually have the dice swatches where you can see the original fabric, which was a white with really fine blue lines on it. And then I had three or four different dye batches where I tried to match it. And I ended up, I think I mixed three different fabric dyes to get the color right, because I was a little bit anal about getting things correct in this, uh, but I managed to dye the fabric correctly, and then I made the shirt to look like an original commercial garment, and then I ripped the sleeves off of it, <laughs> just so it looked like the one in the show. And the uh, the sides, these hems, I actually have the rows of stitching to keep the shirt from fraying here, um, so it's got a frayed edge, and then it's got a double row of stitching to hold the frayed edge in place so it can't fray anymore. The original shirt in the show didn't have that because honestly they needed it for like two days of shooting and they were never going to use it again so yeah um but i did manage to recreate the shirt and in some cases i slightly improved on the original designs because the original shirt they had not taken a great deal of care you know it's, it's just an off-the-rack oxford shirt so it's whatever they happen to grab off a department store rack 
But they had not lined up the pocket stripes. And I looked at those pictures and I thought, I could make this shirt accurate, but it's going to drive me crazy if the stripes don't line up. So I was very proud that my pocket stripes lined up on both pockets. Uh, that's a really r ridiculous thing to be proud of, but it was important to me because I didn't want to be irritated every time I looked in a mirror. So my pockets line up, so that's my, my great source of pride on these. Um, and it has this beautiful 1970s uh, arrow-shaped placket that comes all the way down and comes to a point and then has the eyelets and the leather laces. And it's basically just a fairly hideous color combination and everything else, but hey. Um, so that's this shirt. The undershirt underneath it, which is not nearly as pretty, and it actually took me quite a lot of effort to get this on my duct tape dummy because my shoulders are wide enough that I couldn't get the shirt down over it, so I can't take it all the way off, but I can show you the sleeves. Uh, this is basically, I think I took the collar off and it's more or less just a v-neck underneath, um, and this is a yellow linen that I then did a lot of splatter and spray dyeing and painting and it's got a whole lot of distressing on probably not all of this detail showing up with the camera because it's so far away let me let me ease this up closer so there's a whole lot of dirt um because in the in the show it's supposed to look mud splattered and i took this in my basement and i have a uh, a concrete shower in my basement because this house was built in the 40s and showers were not really a thing in every house and so they a lot of people just added showers in the basement because there was plumbing access there um so i went into the totally unfinished shower in my basement and just took spray bottles and went crazy with dye so um the, fortunately i had the facilities to do that otherwise i would have been doing that in my driveway probably um but i had a lot of fun making dirt and splatter and then i went in and did some detail painting to make some more distinctive splotches um and i did that with this blue shirt as well if i it's mostly ooh, hit the microphone it's mostly down at the bottom but there's a lot of staining and splotching on it too so i love to i have a whole huge blog post on how to distress fabric it's something i really enjoy um so that shirt is not nearly as elaborate because it's just a snaps up the front it's a v-neck it's got long sleeves but uh but the distressing was fun um and then the vest which you can see the front but here's the back the vest was an interesting problem because it should be made out of split uh, cowhide it's suede but i didn't want the weight of a leather vest especially with all the other stuff i had to be carrying and doing um so i ended up making this out of a thin um it's an upholstery vinyl it's a specific kind of upholstery vinyl that's thinner than the average kind but it actually has a fake suede backing on it so you could you know flip it over so the vest which i can actually just pull off the suede part is the back the the wrong side of the fabric and all of this is the same material and then the inside is the correct side of the upholstery vinyl so it actually looks fairly leathery but it's a lot thinner and it was a lot easier to run through my sewing machine to do the detail st stitching and you can see there's uh, there's actually appliques with with some curvature and some detail on it that I had to add and and up on the shoulders here where there's uh, some additional leather detailing and the leather fringe which this is actually leather I was sewing through about four layers of it and I didn't want to go through four layers of cowhide because I thought that might break my machine my machine's good but it's not a leather machine <laughs> um, and this was another case where I had to improve on the original because in my screen caps I could see where the machine had jammed and they just had like a rogue row of stitching running off one direction and they'd try to rip it out and the some of the costumes were not made uh, with as much detail as you would normally see from, you know, a huge big budget production. Because it was this was not a huge big budget production. It was a uh, slightly underfunded TV show that sadly did not afford a third season. <laughs> um, so they uh, they had done a lot of you could tell they had one set of costumes as opposed to having many duplicates for for multiple days of shooting. Um, so I tried to be as careful as I could with the stitching. So the stitching actually follows the lines and looks appropriate on me as opposed to being totally accurate and having random wonky stitches. But you know, it, again, that's that's me being I need it to be correct because I'm going to be having it on my body. Um, the uh, the blue suede, I could not could not acquire turquoise suede leather i looked I, we have a leather wholesaler in town i contacted leather retailers out of state nobody had this color of suede leather so i got some uh, some turquoise suede and i took my copic markers and managed to hand dye by scribbling on it with alcohol-based ink all of the suede to this color it didn't start that color it started white um and that's the same thing i did with all of this stuff up here so uh lots of lots of little handwork on here that was pretty fun to do you know you throw on an audiobook and you sit down and you dry out three markers trying to color all your suede by hand and then all of the you know the rivets and the little horseshoe uh, studs and everything I was able to acquire those from a leather shop too 
those are all fairly straightforward commercial product, which I tried to match everything I could as best I could. Um, because so much of the fashion from this series was based in Western wear, and because I live in Indiana where we have Western wear shops, I actually was able to take my screen caps in uh, for Panto's costume, which this character, Litsy Bits, is the one I played. Mark played Panto, who is her brother, and uh, dresses very similarly. And I went in with my enlargements of the screen caps to a Western wear shop where somebody I knew worked and said, okay, here's all the product I need. Help me narrow it down. And this employee was able to look at it and say, oh, that's this brand. Oh, yeah, we used to carry that. I can order that for you. Oh, we can get this. And so I was able to match the exact items they used on the TV show because they weren't making all these from scratch. They just bought them. So a lot of the details were really easy to match because we could purchase them. Um, but for some reason, this vest didn't exist in commercial form. I don't know why, probably because it's weird looking. Um, so there's there's the vest. I also did all of the leather, this entire costume set, every single piece on my costume except for the leggings. She she wears, they look a lot like this actually, they're, they're tan, uh, uh, no they're gray leggings, they're, they're very much like this. Um, she wears commercial leggings and commercial western boots, which I managed to find the exact boots they used on the actress. Everything else I made from scratch, including the belts and the leather work and all of it. Um, so these I bought wholesale leather, cut the flats, um, glued it around a, a uh, ring for a buckle. This one, again, got a uh, leather flat, installed all the studs, punched holes, put a buckle on. I mean, making belts is really easy. I've done it for a lot of costumes. Once you have a leather punch, you know, you're good to go. So that's not terribly exciting. But the swords, let me get this out of the way. The scissor swords, which are ridiculous, and one of the fun things about this costume, these are Scissor Cowboys characters. So I don't actually have, there's there's a whole pouch full of accessories that go with the costume back here, jewelry and stuff that I haven't pulled out. But these are really fun. So the characters have, have swords because it's a medieval fantasy, except it's a medieval fantasy by way of American Westerns with scissors. So um, they have sword fights with giant pairs of scissors which I also made, um, but I was talking about leather work. So this is the uh, the sheaths, which I made for um, Panto and Litsy Bits, all cut from the same leather flats, actually, that I used for the belt. And then we did hand stitching um, because I, I didn't have a leather machine big enough. So I took my power drill, drilled with the finest uh, drill bit I had, drilled holes all the way down through three layers of leather, and then hand stitched, um, double stitched with... This is actually carpet thread, so heavy-duty carpet thread all the way around both of the sheaths and installed all the rivets and everything, uh, the studs, and then, you know, buckles. It's got a frog, standard, goes on a belt. Um, so I was I was pretty happy with how these turned out because if I didn't have to run them through my sewing machine. I could use a heavier grade leather, and they actually do hold up quite, quite a bit better than uh, in the past I've used garment leather so I could stitch it. This actually works a lot better because it's more like what you... Not that anybody would have giant scissors to put in a sheath, but if you did, it's like what you'd use. Um, the scissors themselves, we had a lot of fun with. They were extremely labor intensive, but again, by careful consideration of the screen caps, I was able to figure out how they'd made the original because they hadn't patched over the seams very well and I could blow them up off the Blu-ray and figure out where the layers of wood had uh, laminated together. So this is three layers of plywood. Um, the blades are one layer, they're the center. And I cut these out with a jigsaw in my driveway um, for both pairs of scissors. So the, the blades are one layer, and then it's a sandwich with two layers, one stacked on the top and one stacked on the bottom. So it's, I don't know, can you actually see the seams? Oh, here's a spot. Here's a spot where the paint's chipped, so you can see. So you can see where the, the layers of wood are stacked together. So I cut out the three layers with the jigsaw. Actually, it was six layers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Actually, it was 12, because there, there were six for each sword. Um, and then uh, glued them together, clamped them, let them dry put uh, wood filler over them, and then sanded them down by hand all over the place. I spent a lot of time that summer sitting out in my yard sanding things. There was a lot of sanding involved in these, um, especially when we get to Susie, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, and so my, I have the uh, the gold scissors, and then pantos are silver. Um, the crest, I actually have the crest that goes on here, which I made separately, but I managed to pop it off after Gen Con because I put these back in the sheath and it caught on the edge. So there is a little colored crest that goes here. It's in one of the pouches over there. Um, by comparison, so this this is the one that I made. I bought some of the screen-used co costumes at auction after the series was canceled, which, of course, was after 
we had made the costumes, so we couldn't get them before and use them as a reference or just wear them. Um, this is one of the, the screen-used props that was used by one of the guards who wears that costume back there, which is also screen-used. And I realized upon receiving this that mine are actually finished slightly better because on these, they're, they're kind of... Granted, this was probably a stunt prop because it's pretty beat up and it's actually got a lot of gaffer tape holding it together where the pieces had broken on set. Um, but you can see you can see more or less how it's assembled and you can see the uh, the lamination and it works exactly the same way. So my my detective work was rewarded on the uh, blowing up the Blu-ray captures and figuring out exactly how it went together. Um, the only difference is these Kellum symbols here on theirs are 3D printed. Since I do not own a 3D printer, uh, I made mine out of cardboard and or card um chipboard chipboard and layered it and uh, and gessoed over it so these are a little bit higher tech um but they had more resources than i do so yeah, it's not gonna stay there let's put this back here these are incredibly hard to store as well they pretty much have to hang or sit upside down because since the leather sheath uh is not reinforced at the tip you can't stand them on end and it's just a little bit awkward and that doesn't want oh that's because i have it going the wrong way there actually is a right and a wrong way. There. But it's great fun to run around with giant scissors at cons. And they're super lightweight because they're made out of plywood. So that's easy. Um, where was I? Let's see. What's next? Uh, the hat I did a lot of distressing on. I may have mentioned I like making things dirty for costumes. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of dirt there's a lot of scuffing to match the uh, the original one. I made the hat band. I could never identify what hat band she had. It just doesn't show up very well in the show. So I got as close as I could. Hand sewed a bunch of turquoise beads. Put some. She does have fringe on the back. So I got as close as I could. But um, the hat was actually hard to find one that fit me over the wig. I have an enormous head. My head is 23 inches, and then I have three feet of braids that have to coil around it. And then I had, for this particular costume, an incredibly thick, fluffy Arda wig, which adds like another two or three inches. So I basically needed a 27-inch hat, which doesn't exist. Um, so I got this, and I have a hat stretcher, and I managed to contort it out of shape enough that it would sit just on the back of my head, but it is not big enough to go all the way down around my head, which is fine, because the character also doesn't wear her hat all the way down. She sits it on the back of her head like a terrible 1950s western. Um, but it's a it's a Scala hat. It's a nice hat. It's actually held up fairly well, despite all the abuse I've put it through. Um, I'm trying to move things out of the way so I don't knock them over accidentally as I bring other pieces forward to talk about. Let's see, what next? What next? Um, let's talk about Susie's crown. All of Susie's props I made with um, most, well, not all. Actually, yes, all. All of these I used uh, Freeform Air, which is made by Smooth On. And um, it is a two part, like an epoxy foam putty type compound that is incredibly hard when it dries and also incredibly strong when it dries. Um, oh, hang on. We've got, I should check the chat more often. <laughs> Run with scissors. Thanks, Laura. Uh, what is the teal thing with the gold in front of the golden scissors? This, this thing? Is this what we're talking about? Um, this is Queen Susie's grimoire. So Queen Susie, which is the character Laura played with a big red and black ball gown, uh, has a lot of accessories. Um, she has a magic wand, she has a crown, she has a grimoire, and she has a dress with a giant stand-up evil queen collar, and it's it's very over the top. There's a reason I picked her to cosplay first before Lara claimed the character, um, which is fine, because I think I was actually a lot more comfortable and a lot more mobile in Litsy Bits than I would have been in Queen Susie, but I ended up making Queen Susie anyway, and, uh, and then Lara got to wear it. Um, I love that crown too. I love wearing that crown and acting dangerously crazy. Yeah, Susie's a Susie's a little bit insane, so it's a lot of fun because insane evil queen, and you get to dress up in in weird stuff. Um, so freeform air, which is uh, an AB epoxy type, epoxy putty type foam, so it's super lightweight. Uh, so with the crown, I the base of the crown, this this part down here was a strip of warbler over. No, it's not Warbla, it's um, Terraflex, which is, it's Tandy Leather's version of Warbla. It's still a thermoplastic. It's basically toe puff material. Um, but it's a strip of Terraflex over something else to reinforce it, possibly EVA foam to make it thicker. And then, yes, it is EVA foam. I can see it. It's green EVA foam. Uh, and then it has uh, a wire armature that I built um, using aluminum, uh, super light, 
it's a I think it's a 16 gauge aluminum wire that I twisted up and made all the shapes uh, which this is this is exactly what hers looks like it's got little tree branch shapes all over it um, and then I put aluminum foil over that so it was aluminum wire to hold the shape aluminum foil to pad it out and then a layer of fairly thick chunky layer of the freeform air over that freeform air dries in a couple of hours takes i think overnight to cure fully and then i power sanded it a lot so uh, i used a dremel i used a power sander i used sandpaper and i used a whole lot of eye and lung protection so i'm wearing full respirator goggles like i have plastic bags over my body because the dust is toxic you don't want to you don't want to breathe most of this. Oh, Laura is sharing a casual hallway shot of the costumes in the chat if you want to see what it looks like finished. Um, so I, I sanded, I put all this chunky layer of freeform air on it, sanded it down, and then I hand painted the wood grain onto uh, onto all of these. And then these little uh, acrylic gems, little teardrop ones, that is one place where I actually deviated from the original because I liked these better. Um, the original had them in metal settings, so you had the tree branch with a metal setting stuck to it with the gems inside and I thought the metal settings looked really chunky and also really unstable like they could get knocked off easily in transit and since we didn't have a props master and we had to carry these ourselves I went with something I could actually glue a little more flush um, so it's got little gems all over it I did the exact same process with the magic wand except this one also has batteries and a light inside so the magic wand lights up and uh, these crystals at the end are actually they're chandelier crystals, they're glass crystals that I glass painted blue. They had been a, an iridescent clear, like a, a, an AB type crystal. Um, and they're, they're quite heavy because they are glass. Uh, and then they have a an LED flashlight inside underneath and they switch on and off. Um, sadly, this does not actually perform real magic, but it looks like it does. So that's the important thing. And you can see a little better the texture on this one. I, I actually carved out all this wood grain texture after I uh, sculpted and then sanded down the shape, I took a Dremel with a uh, carbide cutting blade and gouged all of these lines in with a Dremel on the lowest speed possible so it didn't cut too deep um, to give it a really consistent wood grain texture all over because that was, rather than trying to do it by hand with the tool, I thought the Dremel would be more consistent cut depth and it was. So then I hand painted that one. And the Grimoire. I am I have to admit, I'm probably proudest of this piece because it is it looks exactly like the one in the show. It's really cool. Uh, and it also uh, serves a function. So cosplayers don't have pockets. We never have pockets. None of these costumes have functional pockets. I did, for Litzy Bits, make a belt pouch to carry her stuff. So it's got a leather pouch that goes in the back of her belt. And this way I could carry my phone and my wallet and things when I'm at a con. It's not originally part of the costume, but it looked okay with it. Um, I did the same thing for Panto, although Panto was wearing commercial pants and he actually had hip pockets because he's a guy and they get hip pockets. Girls don't. I had stretched leggings. What do you want? Um, so for Queen Susie, because she's in a huge floofy ball gown with ruffles everywhere, didn't really lend itself to pockets because of the way the corset and everything were structured. Um, so we gave Susie a uh, grimoire that is actually a secret purse. So it opens up and she can carry stuff in it. In fact, when I when I opened this, I brought I picked it up from Laura's earlier and I had brought it to my house, but I noticed there was stuff in it and it had our Gen Con medallions. We won oh, all three of them. Um, we, we took these costumes to uh, ASEN and won best group in ASEN, and then we did a larger group. We had several friends join us to expand our group to be five people, I think, six pe five, five people total uh, at Gen Con, and we won um, first place in whatever whatever division we were in in 2018. It was, it was either professional or group, and I honestly don't know which because they changed the rules at some point. Um, but these are our Gen Con medals that we won at Gen Con, which have been in that book since 2018. <laughs> since August 2018. So we probably ought to put these someplace at, you know, some point. I say that. I've got Gen Con medals hiding all over my house. So we've been attending for enough years. Um, anyway, so as you may have seen uh, on the inside, which I probably should have left open, um, this has a chicken inside. That is because this book originally came from Michael's. It was one of those storage boxes that has like little farmhouse eggs on the front. And uh, so there, it has chickens on the inside, which I guess is just a bonus chickens. I don't know. Um, but I painted over the uh, entire outside. I, I mixed all my paints. So it's a super dark green, almost black. And then this um, surface texture, all of this part is wallpaper. I got paintable wallpaper from Menards, soaked it in water, and then did wet on wet, watered down acrylic 
painting using, you know, wet on what watercolor techniques and did layer after layer after layer of that to make the paper puff up to its maximum height and then also tint it. And then I did another dark wash over it to pick up the grain in the paper. So it's, it's just wallpapers glued onto the front of the book. Um, I cut these shapes out, all the little symbols uh, are cut out of the wallpaper and there's a piece of red cardstock painted. I painted the red cardstock and glued it down to the book first and then glued the wallpaper over it. Um, this is more of the freeform error, which I did the exact same technique on uh, that I did the wand and the crown. And then I carved wood grain and I put little knot work and stuff in it. And then these, what is this? This is Warbla. I'm pretty sure that's Warbla uh, for the clasp. Uh, this is leather. I have a lot of leather in these costumes. And then lots more of the jewels. Um, I actually did originally they're in the next room i made the identical pieces for the back of the book because originally the book does have them on the back but because of the way that we were storing these and carrying them around i ended up not putting them on because i was worried they were going to get knocked off because we basically cram all these things in a giant box or a suitcase and tote them around and having a flat side was a lot safer because i was worried that you know if this stuff comes off honestly the glue is stronger the glue on the back of the uh, freeform air is stronger than the back of the wallpaper <laughs> i thought it might take the whole back of the book off so the back is plain which is not totally accurate but the front was very pretty um and it just looks cool and it's fun to carry around a book especially if it also has your phone and wallet and stuff in it um so that is the grimoire um and what haven't I talked about? I haven't talked about Panto, but I don't actually have any pieces of Panto here. So Panto is the reason I own an embroidery machine. Um, Panto is another scissors cowboy, just like Litzy Bits. He wears a blue Western shirt with a fringe yoke with a full back piece of fighting stallions on the back. Um, and that costume piece, if you add up all of the time that we spent researching that costume piece, it probably took longer than any other piece in the entire set. Because once I'd identified, you know, I'd, I'd screen capped all the angles, I'd figured out all of the designs, figured out what they were. Mark and I sat down for three straight days. We just got our both our laptops, sat down together, and scrolled through every embroidery, commercial embroidery site on the internet to identify what patterns those were. So we spent three days just researching embroidery patterns to find out what patterns they had used so we could buy the same patterns and embroider them. Because <laughs> they're all commercial patterns. None of them were original for the show. You can just go to, you know, embroiderydesigns.com or something and buy them. Um, so we did a whole lot of research on that, but once we had them, Laura owns an embroidery machine, but she has a fairly small, what is it, like a four by six hoop or something. It's, it's a fairly small hoop. It's not a really big hoop. Uh, and Panto's embroidery piece on the back is like 10 by 14 or something. It's huge. And there's, even if you're going to rehoop, it's not going to be possible to do a, a design of that size stitched out. Um, because even with the largest hoops commercially available for home machines, you still have to do two hoops. And it's a very, very large uh, pattern. So we did um, we did some estimation. We we actually tried to find somebody who would embroider it for us. Um, didn't work out. You know, there, it was a lot of stuff going back and forth. And I finally am just like, look, I've been thinking about getting a machine anyway. This is as good an excuse as any. So I hunted up a machine and bought one. Uh, I bought it used on eBay. So I managed to save a lot of money on it. But it was still not a cheap purchase. And that is the reason I now own an embroidery machine is because of these costumes. But we... Um, we made the shirt. We actually made the shirt twice because it didn't come out the, as well as we'd like the first time. It turned out my embroidery unit on my machine, because I had bought it used, it had a crack in it. So the machine was not as stable as it should have been, and it was not stitching out properly. So I had the machine repaired, and then we redid it again. Uh, I think we, the first one we did for Asa, and the second one we did for Gen Con. Um, and then, ironically, the week before Gen Con, all of the show costumes went up for auction online, which is how I got, it, it was a couple weeks before Gen Con, it's how I got the Kellum Knight costume and the, the set props and things that I have. And um, so I found the auction photos of that shirt, and I matched them up with photos of our shirt. And I'm like, wow, you know, we're off by maybe half an inch on the placement of some of these, but it's darn exact, which just goes to uh, to show the accuracy of Blu-ray screen captures and measuring things out. Um, so that worked out really well. Uh, the fringe is not quite right, but that's the only detail. It's not, It's we, we couldn't get the same kind of fringe. I looked, it didn't come in that color. So we spent a lot of time doing that, but at least, you know, once the embroidery machine was running. I didn't have to do that by hand, which was good. Um, 
so Panto was, we did a lot of commercial pieces for Panto because that's what they did in the show. So we were able to match a lot of the exact Western wear bits. Um, we did all the embroidery for Panto, you know, the hat and the, the scissor sword and all of that stuff I made just like I did for Litsy Bits. Um, and Queen Susie, uh, which I really wish I had a chance to show, but it probably wouldn't fit in this room, honestly, um, is, I don't know, about 800 miles of ruffles. It's a lot of ruffles. Um, I actually... I know I hand ruffled over 80 feet of the two inch ruffles that go around the edge. And I don't know how many yards total of ruffles there are on that dress, but it's, it was a big floofy ball gown with a lot of ruffles. And uh, um, also that, that dress has the distinction of being the most expensive fabric I have ever used in a costume. It terrified me because I, I was able to find the exact fabric they used in the original dress. It was a panne silk velvet with lurex threads embroidered onto it. And I found one supplier in the entire country that had it. It was in the fashion district in New York. And I almost didn't buy it because it was just like, I've never paid three figures for a yard of fabric before, and it's not wide fabric, it's like skinny fabric, and it's still three figures a yard, but I couldn't find anything else close to it, so finally I'm like, okay, look, we're, we're making this big set, we're going to do it with all these people, we're going to do this really cool thing, I'm going to go ahead and buy the fabric, and then I was too scared to cut into it, because I'm like, if I screw this up, that's a lot of money that I've just screwed up, it's not like I can go to Joanne and buy another yard of it, um, but we didn't screw it up too badly, it's okay, it worked out, my, my blood pressure dropped a lot when that dress was done. Um, Panto needs to meet the ironing cowboy. <laughs> oh, hi, Mark. I didn't know you were here. <laughs> Everybody say hi to Mark. Mark was our Panto. Um, scissors cowboy, iron cowboy, dishwashing cowboy. I'm sure that if we had a full lineup of all the cowboys doing all of the tasks, then my job here would be a lot easier because I could just delegate to you cut this and you sew that and you iron that. We don't, We need a sewing cowboy as well. Can be friends with the Scissors Cowboy. One has the thread, one cuts it. I don't know. Um, did you buy the original Panto, Mark? I forgot. I remember we did the photos. The, you know, there was a lot that we, we bid on in those auctions that I couldn't remember which way the auction auctions uh, came out. But it's pretty awesome if you have both Pantos hanging next to each other. <laughs> you can tell them apart by the French, I guess. So, um... So speaking of the original costumes, um, I do have the Kellum Knight costume, which I can show. Uh, I, I have worked in film, uh, both in front of and behind the camera, and it is an absolute truth that film costumes are very rarely as good as you think they are. Um, big, big, big budget projects like, you know, if you're if you're working on the Avengers or something, you've got enough costume budget and enough resources to make some really fabulous costumes that look just as good off camera. Uh, if you were working on Lord of the Rings, Yes, the costumes are just as good. They are actually better off camera because there's a lot of detail you don't see on camera. Your average TV show doesn't have that kind of staff, doesn't have that kind of budget. And nothing nothing says that more than stunt costumes. Um, so stunt costumes can't have any metal on them. They have to be made out of safe materials that if your stuntman falls or stunt person falls, they don't injure themselves. Um, so, for example, we have, we have the um, costumes that we bought from... Uh, the screen used costumes from the Avatar movie, no, sorry, sorry, the last Airbender movie, the M. Night Shyamalan terrible, terrible last Airbender movie that we got and wore to cons as jokes. And they were actually very pretty costumes. It's just they're from such a bad movie. Um, but they had things like uh, we had Water Nation costumes that had the big pewter belt buckles with the waves on them. Well, they can't use pewter on the stunt costumes, so the stunt costumes had silicone ones that are flexible, that sort of thing. And for the Kellum Knights, because they're all wearing lots of metal gear, um, they need to be things that the actors can actually move in and the stunt performers can actually move in. So we have a Kellum Knight helmet. Yes, the helmets really do just look like castles that they wear on their heads. Um, and it's made out of EVA foam that's been painted. So uh, the entire thing is flexible. You can you can see it's flexy here. It's a thick foam, but it's soft. And then it has big foam blocks. Actually, one of them's loose. I can pull it out. Um, there's the loose one. has foam blocks hot glued inside it, high tech, um, that they would use to pat it on the actor's head. And then it has a leather strap uh, screwed inside with a Chicago screw, screw, screw Chicago screw, um, that would just buckle under their head like a dog collar. And that's what they would use for the helmets. So they're, they're very classy high tech. And, uh, then they have little rivets around the outs outside edges. Um, but that amused me. And then the, the beautiful, terrible, beautiful night costumes. 
are made out of all sorts of delightfully bad materials. So some of these are just like vinyl, mesh, things with acrylic paint slapped on them, various textures of stuff. I mean, at least the textures look interesting. And then you have the shoulders, the, the pauldrons, which are made out of textured EVA foam layered over each other and literally held on with zip ties. That is a zip tie. These are zip ties. You can see the zip ties at the top here. And that is that is how film costumes roll, yo. Here's oh, This has two zip ties on this side. You can see little square boxes there where the zip ties hold together. Um, it does have a metal clip to hold it shut. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of Velcro and things in here. Um, and John wore this for a Gen Con group because, you know, I got it at auction. Why not? Um, it's got some double stick tape. It's got some safety pins. So, yeah, really high tech. I'm sure there's gaffer tape on this. There's definitely gaffer tape on the sword. Um, gaffer tape, honestly, is what holds together 90% of movie and TV costumes. It's what holds together most of the sets, too. It's often what holds up the cameras. Sometimes it's what holds together the actors. I've lost track of the number of things I've used gaffer tape for. I built a car out of gaffer tape once. Um, most. It, I held, a, held the car together with gaffer tape. Prop car. Not a real car. It did drive, though. Um... Zip tie cowboy, yes. Zip tie cowboy can go in there with stitching cowboy and ironing cowboy and scissors cowboy and dishwashing cowboy and whatever other tasks we need cowboys for. Um, did I talk about all the pieces? I think I talked about all the pieces I had. No, I didn't talk about all the pieces because I think I have the pieces of the slingshots. So the slingshots actually are in two pieces right now. They're not supposed to be. But after a few cons and getting chucked in a suitcase, it happened. Um, Litsy Bits and Panto have slingshots. You can't see them very clearly in the show, but they are there in one shot or two shots. Um, and I decided that, you know, if we're going to have proper Western cowboy fantasy people, they can't just have slingshots. They need to have horseshoe slingshots. So I went to a, a local farrier supply store, bought the tiniest little pony shoes. These are like like mini horseshoes. They're so, so tiny. And um, so it's a real horseshoe. I bought two of them, one for me and one for Mark, um, and put the, uh, the leather stuff on it to make the slingshot. And then I went to Goodwill and bought, one was a knife and one was a carving it was like a carving set um that had these dark uh what's the word i'm looking for some sort of treated wood glazed with uh, varnish over it you know it was, it was a weird dark color um, and we sanded off all of the varnish on the handles to leave just the handle and then i took a, uh, a metal cutting blade with my dremel and cut off the end of the knife and the the carving knife um or the in the carving fork and attached it with something that was supposed to work on metal but didn't work very well um, on the back so that we had the little slingshot made out of pony shoes. And unfortunately, after being chucked in a bag a few times, the glue came off, so it does need to be re-glued, but still says stainless Taiwan on the handle. Um, but we did have little little pony shoe slingshots, which I made just for fun. Nobody cared except me that they were there, but I thought they were fun, so, so we made them. Um, and then, you know, I've got like random assorted bits of, there are other accessories that go with costumes, but they're mostly effective if you see the entire costume on its own. Um, so that's, that's a little show and tell. Oh, this is, this is the uh, frog for the slingshot that goes with that. Drops in the slot. Um, that's show and tell on Dirk Gently. So Grace, I hope you enjoyed that since you said you wanted to see costume details. Um, does anybody have any questions or want to see anything up close since... I'm just in my sewing room. Oh, if you were here last week, by the way, let me get this off of Flynn's head. Um, this is the, after I thermoformed, uh, the tiara I made last week live as a demo. Um, I mean, as, it's, it's a costume piece. I'm going to be wearing it. But I, I did go ahead and heat form it after it had cooled down. So it's got a little more of a curve to it. So that's the finished tiara. If you saw that being made last week. Um, yeah, so all I did was after after all the glue had dried and all the uh, everything had set and everything had cooled down, I just heated it up with a heat gun, formed it around the the head cast, and then bowed it out a little. So it's it's got just a tiny bit of a uh, excuse me, what's the word I'm looking for? A convex curve, brain. 
<laughs> pandemic brain um convex curve uh, going uh laterally across the width of it so it catches the light just a little bit better and looks just a little bit shiny but otherwise it's the exact same thing like i didn't add any paint or anything i just curved it out a bit and i did try it on and i'm gonna have to trim it down because i forgot that my wig that i'm wearing this with is a lace front <laughs> so i can't just cram the pieces up under the wig lace because that'll be bad so i'm gonna have to trim the edges but i'll probably just cut it down by about an inch and then uh, leave a gap at the end for the uh, the bobby pin and the ends will tuck under the hair just as well. Um, Grace says, so fun. Tell me, did I mess up on the Susie seams I tried to help with that one time? I think it was the bodice and I've often wondered. I don't remember anything being wrong with the seams. Um, I don't remember which ones you worked on, but if I had had to fix it, I think I would have remembered. So I think it's fine. <laughs> Laura might know, uh, she might remember better which um, which part of it you worked on because I honestly a lot of Susie there was so much sewing on that costume because it was just layer after layer after layer of ruffles um, that I don't remember who did what on it but no I don't think I don't think there was any problem with it so we appreciate the help we always appreciate slave I mean uh, uh, help from friends friends who are uh, in the neighborhood and helping out with things Laura says she has no memory of this place. Pre-con cramming left a brain gap. Pre-con cramming does a lot of brain gapping. Um, sometimes I pull things out. Like I was looking through my, my reference binder um, for something for another costume recently. And I noticed in the notes it had a description of how I made one of the pieces. And I'm like, I have no memory of making that piece. There's a photo of it. Evidently I made that piece. I do not remember that piece existing. Cool. Good job, brain. Because it's just so much so fast. And you're constantly, you know, going from one project to the next to the next and dealing with, uh, oh, no, that's that's not going to have time to dry. That's not going to have time to cure. What can we do to fix it? So there's a lot of pre-con cram. If we were good people at managing our time and actually planned ahead and scheduled things out, we wouldn't have to do pre-con cram cramming, but, but we're not good people. Sometimes we just stay up all night the night before the con trying to put stuff together. Sometimes we go into judging with the paint still wet. I did that with Crowley. Um... I did that, do that with words too. Who wrote this and why is it in my manuscript? Yeah, sometimes I really surprise myself because uh, I'll be going through a manuscript, especially anything I write in November. Uh, November is NaNoWriMo, National NaNoWriMo Month, and you are cranking out so many words in such a short period of time that frequently I will go back to a manuscript I wrote the previous year and I'm like, I do not remember this plot. Like, there's an entire side plot that I wrote in in November that I did not know was in this story. Cool. Now I need to figure out how to resolve that. I'm sure I had a plan when I wrote it six months ago. So uh, manuscripts are like that. And especially if you're writing under pressure. I got something in my eye. One of the costumes has attacked my eye. Um, so uh, other questions, stuff you want to see, comments, suggestions, topics for next week. By next week, I'm really, really hoping my materials have shown up because I have this huge backlog of things. I'm like, good, I've got the materials ordered. I'm ready to go. I'm going to style that wig. I'm going to make that prop. I'm going to do all these things. Nothing has shown up. I'm waiting on six different shipments and none of them have arrived. Um, so hopefully by next week, uh, the first shipment's supposed to arrive tomorrow. The next one's supposed to be on Thursday. And I don't know when my wigs are getting here. I know they're out for shipment. They're going to happen eventually. Wigs will appear at some point on my doorstep, I hope. Um, and I've, there, there's a bunch of wigs in that shipment too. So I will be stocked on wigs for a good long while. <laughs> we can do lots of wig styling. And in fact, there's um, I brought home uh, Laura's new wig tonight. I picked up from her. And once the extensions and the wefts get here, uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of wig ventilating. So if you've ever wanted to see somebody ventilate a wig, it's not that visually stimulating, but it's a lot of me sitting still and twiddling with things. If you ever want to watch somebody ventilate a wig, I'm going to be doing a lot of wig ventilating over the next few weeks. I might not do that all on Tuesdays, though, because that would be like an hour of watching paint dry. So let me ventilate a wig fiber and another wig fiber for hours. Um... Wig ventilating is a great time to listen to audiobooks. So, uh, is is what what it sounds like, Bridger? Oh, ventilating. Okay, <laughs> yes. Define ventilating a wig. Thank you. Um, I've got a good example right here because here's one that I've ventilated previously. So, there are two ways of making a wig. Um, and let me grab Flynn's head because that'll be a really good example too. Ah, now Flynn is bald. Flynn's wig is one that I actually need to do wefting in. So when you 
are looking at wigs. There are two ways there can be wigs. You can have a wig that is made of strips of weft. Weft is these strips where all the hair is sewn along a seam. So you can see the, um, let me do it from this side. There's all the hair sewn in a row and then the rows are sewn down onto some elastic so it can stretch. And so all of this is wefting, but it's just rows of hair sewn across a basic loose framework. There's not a solid surface under here. This has more of a solid surface, but that's just so you can have a, a consistent top on the wig. Um, then you can also have, actually, let me grab one from across the hall because I have a better example that I won't have to take that one off the wig head for since that one is blocked and I don't want to unblock it. You can also have a lace, full lace cap. So wefting is strips, it's rows of hair. A full lace cap, if I can get this one off, is a thin mesh. Wow, this wig does not want to come off. There we go. Uh, it's a thin mesh that has individual strips of hair looped around it. So down here, um, this part here, this is weft. You can see the rows. This part up here, the top, is a super fine mesh. It's almost like, uh, it's, it's smaller than tulle. It's somewhere between tulle and organza. And instead of rows of hair that are sewn together, each hair is individually looped around one of the parts of the mesh. Um, so lace wigs have the advantage of looking a lot more natural because if you can see, um, maybe, I don't know if you can see this or not. You can see my hand through it. So if I'm moving my finger, you can kind of see uh, where my finger is. So if I put this over my natural part or put it over natural hair, it'll look like it's actually growing out of my head as opposed to if I have a wig with wefting, you can sometimes have gaps in the wefting or you know, if you've got something that's not really thick in the top, you can have gaps showing through and you can see that there's stitching there or there's elastic there. So a lace wig is a lot more expensive typically. It's a lot more labor intensive because that's usually done by hand, um, but it looks a lot more natural. And so if you're getting a really nice hair replacement wig, like uh, from a company that designs wigs for cancer patients or something, they're typically more likely to be a lace wig and they're typically more likely to run you like $300 as opposed to the $40 or $50 that you'll buy for a nice thick wefted wig. Um, ventilating is the process of attaching the hair to the wig lace. So in this case, this is a lace front wig, uh, meaning let me, let me take the face off. My friends drew a face on my wig head and I've left it on, but I will take it off for demonstration purposes. Um, so when I bought this wig, it didn't have any red in it. It was just a brown wig and I, it was a long straight brown wig and I cut, cut the wig, uh, cut about three feet of the wig off and put all the red fiber in. This is a lace front wig, which means the back of the wig, all this part of the wig is wefted. The front edge has wig lace, which means when it's on your forehead, it looks like these fibers are growing out of your skin. So there's really fine mesh with individual hairs coming out of it. So it's a natural hairline rather than just having like a hard seam where the hair starts. Um, the, the mesh will sit almost invisibly. I don't know how much of this is showing there. It's on my finger. The mesh will sit invisibly over your skin and it'll look like hair fibers are coming out of it. A lace front wig is the type of wig you will typically see in professional productions. So like if you're watching a TV show or a movie, um, there is such a thing as HD lace, which is lace so fine you can't see it. And that's what they're using on those actors. They aren't actually just, you know, making them grow their hair out when they have their hairstyle change. Um, so a lace front wig will have that in a strip along the front. The strip will be like one to three inches, depending on what kind of wig it is. If I'm ventilating a wig, I am taking a tiny little needle with a hook. It's like the world's smallest crochet hook. It's usually sized to hold one or two strands of hair. And I'm sticking the hook through a hole in the lace catching with the uh, the hook on the other side, one or two strands of hair, pulling them through and looping them around themselves and then feeding the entire strand of hair through. So I'm basically tying a knot with the hair around the individual thread of lace. That is how you make the lace front wig <laughs> look like this. It's how all of this fiber was added in. It's how I did all the red on here. It's a very time consuming process because you're doing one or two strands of hair at a time. And even if you're fast, you're gonna do like a couple of inches in a whole session, um, depending on how long your sessions are, obviously. If you, if you don't mind working for hours, you can do it uh, faster. But on this one, um, it was a pretty straight hairline to begin with. So all of the, 
all the shaping, so these, these curved sections that come forward and then come down the sideburns, I added all of that. The actual wig originally started right about here, actually, you can see. So all of this other stuff was added, all the red was added. Uh, and that's called ventilating. Uh, it's a weird term for it, but it's just the term that has come to mean that in the industry. Um, ventilating wigs, a lot of work. I ventilated a goatee once, and it was more than enough for me. Yeah, if you're doing facial hair, almost all facial hair has to be hand ventilated because you're gluing it on your skin, so you can't have a seam. It just has to be, you know, a fine mesh with hair coming out of it. So if you buy good quality fake facial hair, it will usually be on a really fine uh, mesh that goes on there. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm catching up on the chat because I was out of the room. Um, oh, adding fennel to a wig. Yes, phenylating would make it smell very different, but would not actually add hair to it, I don't think. Uh, maybe if you eat a lot of fennel, your hair grows? I don't know. Um, so, yeah, kind of like rug hooking. Um, and it's it's really just you're, you have a loop. You're sticking a hook through, grabbing hair, and pulling it through that loop. And the tricky part is you have to twist the hook and wrap it around the hair. So it's, you know, it's... Uh, Basically, do I have, I can do a live demo. Let me grab a piece of leather. Okay, so you have a hair. This is a really big hair. Um, you have a loop of your lace. You are going to reach through, grab a loop, pull it through, and then, let me, let me do this in the middle. You're going to take the hair, pull with your hook a loop of hair through the lace, and then grab the ends of the hair, and pull it through the loop so that it ends up wrapped around. That is that is what it is in macrocosm. You are attaching one strand of hair around a piece of the wig lace. And then you're doing that times thousands because you have to do a whole wig that way. Um, and it is, it is something that is not terribly difficult to learn. Uh, because it's really just one motion over and over and it takes some practice to get good at it And if you're using different size needles, you can be doing it with like one strand versus four strands or whatever But it's just one thing you're doing over and over the big thing is it's Mentally exhausting if you're not listening to an audiobook or doing something else or talking to somebody at the same time Because you're just sitting there going poke it through hook it pull it out poke it through hook it pull it out it's not even as exciting as something like knitting okay and i say that as somebody who knits only because i have to for costumes not because i really enjoy it um so ventilating is just tedious um but all that to say i have just picked up a new wig that i need to ventilate and it is a wig with a lace top actually i think it might be it might even be a full lace wig laura do you remember what you bought i, I don't know we looked at a lot of wigs online um but it's another one where it's a it's a lace top, so the entire top of the wig is mesh, and I need to be putting sections of different colored hair in throughout the wig. So there's going to be like a lot of, let me part the hair and ventilate 6,000 strands here, and then go over here and ventilate a bunch more strands here. So I might just have to, I don't know, interview somebody. Maybe I'll have a special guest that week and just be talking to not be going out of my mind while I, I ventilate that. Uh, or, you know, maybe it's just not a good spectator sport. I don't know. It's it's not that exciting. Um, so, yeah, if, if it is a full lace wig, then I will be doing a lot of ventilating. It is definitely a lace top, I know, because it's one that you can part at any point. And that's, that is the beauty of doing a lace top wig is... This wig is currently parted right there. If I decide, no, I would rather have the part right here, I can just move that hair over, and because it's not sewn in place, I can just part the wig wherever I want. I can style it. This one is actually a human hair wig. Uh, it's a human hair lace top wig, which means this wig was probably four or $500 new. I paid 10 bucks for it because somebody was selling it and didn't know what it was. Um, Sometimes you luck into the best deals. I got two lace front wigs for a total of sixteen dollars. Or sorry, two lace full lace wigs, human hair for a total of sixteen dollars. Uh, it probably would have been about seven or eight hundred dollars new. Um, you know, and you you wash them so they're sanitary. But uh, advertise that one as an ASMR stream for its repetitive, soothing nature. Yeah, yeah. If we, you know, if if things go south and politics land again, we might all just need like a quiet, calm wig filling stream. I don't know. Play some soothing music. It'd be like being in a uh, uh, spa where they just have that sort of nice lilting background sound. Um, sounds like a good activity for a question and answer session. Yeah, if if people have enough questions and answers to 
keep us occupied for, I don't know, an hour of me ventilating a wig. I mean, there's only so much I can narrate when I'm ventilating a wig. At least if I'm, you know, if I'm making something like when I was making the uh, the tiara last week, I could talk about, okay, this is the difference between black warbler and tan warbler, or this is this kind of material, or I could glue this with this material. If it's ventilating a wig, it's like, this is another strand of wig fiber. It's just like the last strand of wig fiber, and nobody wants to sit through an hour of that. But yeah, if you want to think up some questions, then uh, at some point in the future, we could be having a Q&A session, or I don't know, I just might pull in some some live chat, some Zoom some people in. I don't know. We can, we can come up with something for that. Um, I do actually have several other hands-on interesting projects to be working on uh, that I'm waiting on materials to arrive for. I'm going to be doing... My, uh, I made the Blastia template for my Flynn Shifo costume, which I am super stoked about for ridiculous reasons. Um, so here's my template. It's going to look like that, except way cooler. And uh, it's going to end up right there. Uh, and it's going to be made out of various layers of things, including a bunch of uh, resin, because I'm casting all of these uh, cabochons. They're going to be dyed resin. So I can be doing live casting demos and also building up the base layers and all that. I'm, I'm still debating what I'm going to surface it with. Uh, but that's one thing I could do for one week. And then, of course, the resin's going to take about 16 hours to cure because it's the type of resin it is. So that's not going to be a... We're not going to have a live stream of literally watching the resin dry because that would be really boring. Um, but that is one thing I want to work on. Uh, I am hoping, hoping that the material comes back in stock. I found finally found the fabric that I needed to make a costume, and I'm like, yay, I can get started on this, and that'll give me a lot of stuff I can do. Uh, and then the fabric went out of stock when I ordered it. So um, originally they were predicting it was going to be back in stock today. The prediction has now been pushed back to February 22nd. We're going to see whether or not this fabric actually comes back in stock, or if I have to start the search over again. Um, but that's another one that might not be here for a while. But I do have, uh, and then I have four wigs to style. I have... Um, I need to put the new wefts into Flynn because Flynn, when it arrived, was not as long as I wanted, and I want the hair spikes on top to be longer than an inch and a half. Um, I kind of thought I could fudge it, and it's not going to work. He also needs more on the sides. So I'm going to be doing a lot of hand sewing wefts into a wig and probably doing some additional ventilating. Um, I have the extensions for Lara's wig are coming in, uh, and I've got some additional wefting to do on... Actually, no, Mark's wig. Mark's wig's ready to wear. Mark's wig's fine. It's great. So you find that one unicorn. It's like a wig that's already styled the way you need it to be, and you don't have to do any modification. It almost never happens. Uh, oh, and then I need to do um, plucking, which plucking is the opposite of ventilating. <laughs> ventilating is adding hair to the lace. Plucking is removing hair from the lace, and I have to do some of that to my Virgil wig, too. Um, oh, yes, Laura, I, I see your narration for the... David Attenborough documentary on how wig ventilating goes, and I think I would go to sleep during that. I'm not even sure I would make it through uh, through ventilating a layer. <laughs> um, oh, Mark, was the yay in reference to your wig? Which I realized when I was looking at reference images that wig we ordered is perfect for first strike. Unfortunately, we're not doing first strike. We're doing uh, the main game, but... I, it means I don't have to actually do much styling. I think it's, I, I'm going to trim the back a little bit and like part the bangs differently. And that's probably it. I might have to trim the bangs, but that's like 10 minutes of wig cutting. I can handle 10 minutes. It's not 16 hours of ventilating a lace front. Um, yeah. So, so Mark, you will probably have a costume piece done sooner than I will for that costume set. Um, because yours is going to come already done and mine isn't. I thought it was, but it's not. Um, so anyway, all that to say, next week's topic is going to be determined entirely by what comes in the mail. So I don't know what it's going to be yet, but it will be a making a thing. I don't know what thing, but it will be a making time. Um, so we had show and tell today. Next week will be a demo or making of something. I don't know what. Um, at the very least, I should be able to start casting the resin gems. And that's not terribly exciting unless you like watching me mix resin, but it's something to do. Um, and Laura's suggesting mail-in topics, which, yes, I am totally in favor of mail-in topics. If you're like, you know what? I thought of a thing. I don't know if it's interesting or not, but I will throw it at you. And you can decide. That's fine, too. Uh, or if, if you just want to, like, hear me ramble about stuff. I know um, Grace mentioned at one point, like, telling bizarre stories about things that happen on film sets. Um, I can do that. Uh, I can't use a lot of names, but I can tell you stories. Um, or, you know, we can tell funny con stories. I can get Laura and Mark in here at some point and we can I don't know come up with 
what are all of the horribly embarrassing things that have happened at cons, or what are the ridiculous skits you did, or who knows what. We've, we've got lots of topics. Um, yeah, crossing your finger. Thank you. I appreciate the finger crossing for packages. Given the state of the USPS and the fact that um, a friend of mine sent me a package that was supposed to be a one-day mail delivery. He's, he's in Lafayette, which is an hour and a half drive from my house. Like, literally, I could drive there and back in an afternoon. He mailed it, paid for one-day shipping. It took eight days to arrive. So I'm like... I don't know if the shipping estimates are actually going to be accurate or not. We'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, if any of the packages, if any one package arrives this week, no matter which package it is, I can start on a project. But I am waiting. All of my costume pieces in progress are waiting on a package to arrive. So I just need a package to come at some point this week. And then I can have hands-on stuff to do. And if not, then I don't know. I'll just have to start a new costume. And... Heaven knows I don't need another one of those because I have like 12 in boxes sitting around the room waiting on me to finish them. I was actually doing, uh, taking inventory last night of my works in progress and trying to write out piece lists and figure out what I actually needed to be working. And I realized I couldn't even remember all the costumes that I didn't have done yet. And I started looking around the room and I'm like, oh, there's three in that box. There's one in that box. There's a whole rack of them over there. Yeah, I've got a lot of works in progress that I need to finish. Um... Oh, question. Okay. How long does an average costume take from start to finish? Uh, you know, it really depends on whether it's a competition costume, whether it's a found item costume. So found item costumes, I think our record for found item costumes was five costumes in 15 minutes, um, which was run around the house, grab all the random stuff out of closets, grab stuff out of the cosplay room, you know, all, all the things we could put together. And we came up with five costumes in 15 minutes. They were made out of things like t-shirts. Like, they were not high-end costumes. Um, Marguerite took three years. So it's really, it totally depends on the costume. Um, I would say most of our competition costumes that we're taking, you know, not just wearing at a convention, but actually taking in for judging in the professional division, probably take in the range of eight to ten months total. Um, but that's also a lot of that is planning. A lot of that is acquiring materials. You know, I have I have made competition costumes in a few weeks, um, but sometimes it's a matter of, you know, with Marguerite, for example, fabric for Marguerite came from three different countries and was bought over a period of two and a half years. Um, so it was it was not a case where I could just run to Joanne and pick up all the fabric for that costume. Um, if it's something I can get the materials locally and I don't have to make a special trip to Chicago or New York, which unfortunately I live in central Indiana. We have Joanne. Some of our Joannes don't carry the majority of the fabric that most of the Joanne chain does. My local Joanne doesn't even carry basic fabric. Like you, you can get quilting fabric at my local Joanne. You can get some garment fabric at my local Joanne, but they don't carry suitings. They don't carry taffeta. They don't carry a lot of the formal wear stuff. They don't carry bridal stuff. Um, basically any of the, they, they do carry upholstery fabric, but any of the stuff that you actually use for costuming typically is not carried at my local store. So if I just want to go and say, hey, what suitings can I find for this costume? I need to drive all the way across town to do that. So sometimes, you know, it's just what am I using to make this costume? And is it something I can get 10 minutes away? Or do I literally need to plan a trip to New York City to get the material for this costume, which I've had to do? Oh, darn, I have to go to New York and watch a Broadway show. Oops. Um, I, I try to go to New York at least once every year or two to see Broadway shows because I'm a huge Broadway nerd. But um, but needing to buy fabric is a convenient excuse. Um, so a lot of it is just resources. But I would say, on average, we typically make our costumes in about half a year, slightly over, because we, we, we really only compete at two conventions now, um, because we've, we've pointed out of so many of them. And it's, it's not really fair. You know, we've been doing this for enough years that if they don't have skill divisions where they're, they're putting professionals against each other and putting the novices against each other and separating everybody out, I do not want to go in and compete against somebody that this is their first or second con. That's not remotely fair. I don't need to win that badly. I want them to have a chance to do cool stuff too. So we don't compete at a lot of cons that don't have skill divisions or that are just small enough cons that we don't feel like it's fair for us to compete in. Um, and a lot of cons we judge now or we staff at instead of competing. So the only two cons we consistently compete at are Gen Con. We compete at Gen Con every year. And ASEN we compete every other year. ASEN is in, in mid mid-May. It's usually the second or third weekend in May. Gen Con is usually the first week of August. And it is our tradition to 
the day after the convention ends, start talking about what we're going to cosplay next. It doesn't always work out that way, but that's the way we've done it for years. So usually we're looking at like, you know, the second week of August is when we start thinking about what we're going to be doing the following May. So that's kind of our time frame. How soon we actually start that costume? Eh, it really depends on what we're doing, whether or not we're traveling, who's got conventions, who's got work, you know, stuff like that. Um, Let's see, what else do we have? Uh, Grace says, I do like these costume tours like today and would love to see others in a similar day way from time to time. Okay, good to know. Um, I will try to figure out what I can bring over from Laura's house. <laughs> like what, there, there are some costumes that literally won't fit in the room. Um, I don't think my wings would fit in here. My, my wings are 14 feet and eh, the, the room's probably 14 feet wide, but they won't fit on camera. Um, we might have to take a field trip to Lara's and just do like a stream from Lara's house where all the stuff lives. Um, Marguerite would be a really cool one to talk about, but Marguerite also takes just a lot of setup because it's, it's five feet wide. It's huge. You know, it's, it's a big dress, um, but it does have a lot of parts and it does have a lot of handwork and details and things. So we can, let me, let me say this. The next time my shipments don't arrive, I will absolutely be pulling something out and doing a show and tell because that's a really good, easy way to fill time. Um, you know, not fill time, but like to come up with a topic on short notice, as opposed to, uh, you know, planning something in advance. Cause if I have to, have my workspace set up to work with thermoplastic or with resin, that takes a lot more planning than if it's just pull something out of the costume closet and talk about it. Um, but the fact that the majority of my competition costumes aren't stored here just for space reasons, you know, Laura's got a big basement and a big attic, and I have a basement that actually has stuff in it that I need to use, uh, and I don't have an attic, so, so that's how it goes. Um, yeah, Laura's pointing out material gathering is a big time sink. Um, and then talking about what we're going to do next. Yeah, which the hazard of talking and not having a firm time frame for it is you end up with stuff like I was just saying, where I've got literally 10 or 12 partly completed costumes in this room right now. Um, I have some of them labeled with, uh, like, here's one under the table. I'm just going to hold this up. Let's see. This has the fabric for Farah, the 10th Doctor, and Agent of Asgard Loki. All of those costumes have part of the costume pieces sewn. Um and I was just talking about this the other day because Agent of Asgard Loki is about to be topical again because the new Loki series is coming out. But um, like I'm, I'm looking at all this. I have all this beautiful um, sari fabric. Farah is a, a costume that is uh, Indian. So I, I bought a bunch of sari silk and made parts of the costume out of it. And it looks really cool. And um, like here's, here's her leather collar. And here's her necklace that I made probably 10 years ago because... This game was new, and it was a PS3 game, and we're now on PS5, so that's how long ago this was. I don't remember what year uh, Two Thrones actually came out. Um, Mark could probably rattle that off, or at least look it up, but but yeah, like th these, are, these are costumes that I should have had done literally a decade ago, and they're just in various stages of not yet complete in my box. Um, Oh yeah, and, and Tenth Doctor, I have I've actually worn my Tenth Doctor costume. This fabric is for the overcoat, which I bought probably six years ago. The overcoat fabric, and I've never actually sewn the overcoat. I do have the suit. I do have the other accessories. Um, I do a lot of Doctor Who cosplay because uh, I Chicago TARDIS, which is the only exclusive Doctor Who convention in this half of the country. There's there's Gallifrey One in California and there's Chicago TARDIS in the eastern half of the U.S. And I have been a staff member at Chicago TARDIS for some years. So I'm actually one of the masquerade judges there and I also teach a lot of cosplay programming there. So I always need a minimum of three Doctor Who costumes for every Chicago TARDIS. And I don't like wearing the same ones all the time because like I've been cosplay, I've probably cosplayed Jack 60 times by now. I do a lot of Captain Jack, but I like doing other characters too. So I now have seven or eight or nine different Doctor Who costumes that I rotate through. And I've got several more that I've got materials for that I haven't made yet. Um, so I do I do a lot of Doctor Who and I do a lot of rotating things around and stealing pieces from one to go with another because that's what they do in the show, so why not? Um, let's see. Uh, did you talk about laser etching at some point? I can talk about it. Um, I have not yet done a, a session on it, but that is something I can absolutely do um, once I figure out. So my, my laser cutter's in the basement. I used to have my router in the basement. Um, router router as an in internet signal, not as in a mechanical router that cuts things out of wood. Um, 
and I moved the router upstairs to better provide signal and cabling for this room. So now I need to figure out how to get a cable back downstairs. So let me work on that. I, there should be a way to do it. I can probably just drop another line somewhere. I'll figure it out. Once I get a cable downstairs where the laser cutter is, again, um, then I can do live broadcast from down there. But because of the way the house is set up, the signal is not really reliable for live streaming from there to where the router is currently. Uh, but yes, that is absolutely something I can do. And it's something I'm going to be doing costume work with because as soon as my material arrives, <laughs> sometime this week, hopefully. Um, I've been doing some research into laser cutting fabric applique, and my goal is to make uh, ready-made, ready-to-iron-on, laser-cut applique pre-backed on the laser cutter, ready to just throw on my uh, the, the costume that is in progress back here, which used to be Sailor Pluto. I mean, it's still, currently this is still Sailor Pluto because it's got Sailor Pluto's time keys all over it, so let me get those off. But um, my Sailor Pluto Fuku, which is the one that I discovered that half of the pieces need remade on, um, actually has uh, a lot of accessories that are going to be getting applique on them. And I was going to do it traditionally, and that's the one that a couple weeks ago I was like, you know, it's going to take me hours to cut this out because it's really fine detail stuff. So I bought some additional materials, and I'm going to try to laser cut it as one entire applique and then do applique of all of those accessory pieces. So... That's another thing I can do. And if I can make it work, if I can make the fabric work in the laser cutter without setting fire to my house, which is a very real risk when you're dealing with lasers, um, then I can do a live stream of that at some point. I just need to test it first to make sure it's safe uh, and also run a cable, but it should be possible. Um, yeah, John says we can make it happen. John and Mark are the ones who helped me drill through three floors of my house to run the cables previously when we recabled re the house in December. Um, it only resulted in one permanently affixed drill bit somewhere between the floors of the house. We don't know where it's not coming out now, uh, but we can we can certainly run a cable somewhere. Um, let's see. I'm catching up. Uh, da, da, da. Tenth Doctor. Two Thrones is 2005. Really? Okay, it must not have been. Was it 2005? Because I thought Warrior Within was later than that. But okay. Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, Prince of Persia Two Thrones was what that fair costume was from. And so at least like late 2000s, 2008, 2009 would probably be the latest that I started that costume. And it's still not done. Um, Madame Vastra. Uh, actually, yes, Madame Vastra is one that, well, Laura is going to be Vastra. We're doing, we have the materials for and they're not done yet. <laughs> You'll notice a trend here. Um, Laura is Madame Vastra, I'm Jenny, and Marcus Strax is our plan. Um, we actually have the oven to do the foam latex heads and everything, and we haven't done them yet because we have a lot of big projects that we have not finished, and those are in the line somewhere. There's a whole queue. There's there's about a decade and a half of queue of things we've bought materials for that we haven't actually finished the costumes. Uh, but we do have all the really cool wools and silks and everything to make the costumes whenever we get to them. But yeah. We, we, we like the Paternoster game. They have their own series on Big Finish now. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> we know where and why the drill bit isn't coming back. Yeah, so uh, my, my house had a room edition put on in about 2011. It was before I bought the house, but they put on a room edition and they did it very badly. And so we think the walls line up and then the walls aren't actually where we think they're going to be. And... Some of the walls are not square, so we, um, my, my TV, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, my TV died. So I, I got a new TV, and I was trying to hang the TV, the new TV on the old TV mount, which didn't go very well. And we could not figure out why the TV was crooked. And the, we kept checking the mount with a level, and we kept checking the TV with a level, and we kept, you know, checking the number of screw holes and everything. And then we figured out it's because the ceiling's actually running downhill, and there's no way to make it look straight because the ceiling's not square. So, eh, the joys of old houses. Um, oh, yes, that sounds like a fun project. Hopefully, I mean, that's the plan. It is going to be a lot of sculpting. And um, I don't, have I talked about monster clay and, and casting and stuff on this stream yet? Because I've talked about it on other streams and I can't, all my streams are running together now that I'm doing this every week. Um, it is definitely a case where we are going to start with a head cast, like I was talking about uh, last week where, you know, we have a full head cast that is 360 degrees, and then using the, the monster clay, which is a, a sulfur-free wax-based clay that you use for casting, uh, and for making originals for casting, basically sculpting the entire creature head 
um, which in the case of Strax and Madame Vastra is quite large. <laughs> it's going to take quite a lot of support and clay. Um, and doing a full sculpt of the entire alien headpiece that goes over the entire head down to the neck. Uh, and then making a mold of that. And then we, we haven't decided. We discussed doing foam latex or doing silicone. The advantage of silicone is we work with it all the time and we already have all the materials. The advantage of foam latex is it's a little lighter weight and it's what they actually used in the show. So it would look a little more accurate. Also has a shorter shelf life so I don't know but we, we haven't gotten that far yet um, but we do have an old oven that if we did foam latex since foam latex is a toxic process that you do not want to do in your food oven um, but we do have an oven available and we do have some other we have we have an external workshop we have a lot of stuff that we could do that it's just going to be a lot of construction prep work which all of which will make for great streaming topics when we get there but uh, it is not on the slate for this year um, my next Doctor Who costume that I've committed to is actually a clockwork droid costume, which, again, I have all the materials for. Just need to get it off the ground. Um, and that's because my fellow judges from Chicago TARDIS, we were going to do a whole clockwork droid group and just have a massive group of clockwork droids and go around the con and freak everybody out because they're creepy. It's awesome. Um, and I just, I need to get on that. But uh, right now that is fifth in line because I have four costumes I'm working on right now that I'm actively building, um, which are the ones I'm waiting on all the materials for. And then that one is, if Chicago TARDIS even happens this year, which who knows? I mean, it was canceled last year, obviously, because we were in a pandemic and nobody knows what the state's going to be. You know, it's it's held in Rosemont and Chicago has been very cautious about allowing public gatherings. So they might hold off and it's, uh, it's Thanksgiving weekend in the U.S. So that's uh, third weekend of November is when it normally happens. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see whether or not that's even happening. Obviously, if the con doesn't happen, I don't need to have the clockwork droid done because we're not wearing it, but we'll see what happens. Um, Laura says, we really did finish a bunch too. I just, Well, the thing is, we, we accumulate costume plans faster than we have time to finish a costume. So we might finish two sets of costumes in a year for all of us. Like, I, in an average year, I will probably make five or six different costumes, but not all of them are competition costumes. A lot of them are going to be something like, you know, River Song, where I put together relatively quickly. I made River in about two or three weeks. It wasn't a really time-intensive project, because a lot of it's street clothes, and a lot of it's stuff I can buy or modify easily. Um, you know, so I might make a Doctor Who costume for Chicago TARDIS, or I might make a, you know, comic book costume that's, you know, Kate Bishop from Hawkeye or something that's a fairly simple costume. And um, I'll do a lot of those, but I'm not doing big sets for all three of us. And if we're doing sets for all three of us, they're usually our competition sets, and they usually take several months. So we only have time to do, like, two, maybe, competition-type sets a year in a good year. And then if there's, like, five or six costumes we actually want to do but we don't get to them right away, then they just get pushed back. And then we've got another set waiting before those and, and they just stack up and, you know, it's, there's only so much time. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, when we were all stuck home last year because pandemic, we should have been working on costumes, but then our motivation disappeared because we weren't having any events. So last year was the perfect time to catch up and none of us were having conventions. So we weren't making stuff. At least I wasn't. Um, that's not true. I sewed several hundred face masks for hospitals, but that's not the same as cosplay. Like that's a totally different thing. Uh, it's, it's not using the creative part of your brain the same way cosplay does because creative energy was just being sucked out last year by everything. Um, so it's it's this perpetual cycle of what costumes do I prioritize because I have specific dates I need to plan for them. Uh, but there's always more costumes than you have time to make. And there's costumes that I'm making for me that are not necessarily group costumes, but that still require a lot of uh, a lot of work. Like I have, there's a box right behind the, the camera right now that is um, my James West costume, which is not done. It's been in a partially stated, you know, partially complete state for uh, for a long time. And I'm the only one doing that because I mean, honestly, there aren't that many characters to cosplay from that series. There's two, maybe, that you could pull off. Um, and uh, you know, and it's 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 one of my favorite series of all time. So, of course, I'm going to cosplay it at some point. Um, but that's something that we don't have a lot of group scheduling for, because since I'm the only one doing it, it's just on my own schedule. And if I'm working on a competition costume that I have a hard deadline because we say, hey, these six people are going to cosplay this group for competition on this date then I have to commit to getting those done first and everything else gets pushed back. So, um, This question may be too elementary for the stream because I'm very new to cosplay, but in case it's not, maybe an episode on how a competition usually works and what it entails. Oh, that would be a good um, 
discussion for like while I'm ventilating a wig or something like maybe Laura and I could get together and do that. Um, that is absolutely a legit question. In fact, we have uh, a couple of articles, blog posts, like tutorial type things on our website and our Tumblr specifically about that topic because a lot of people come in and they're like, oh, competition's scary. That's like you're up on stage and people are looking at your stuff and I don't know. So we have a lot of introductory, this is how competitions work. And it also varies dramatically by region. So different parts of the country, typically the con circuits will operate a little differently. Uh, Sci-fi cons versus comic book cons versus anime cons versus other things like they, they all have their own flavors of competitions and they're very different. So yeah, that would absolutely be a good um, just general talking heads type topic that we could get to. Um, yeah, for that matter, we also, <laughs> Laura says panel, like we, we, we could do panels on that too. We have, um, what, 25, 27 uh, prefab panels that we do at cons that we could just pull some of those topics out too. So if anybody wants to look at our website and look at the panel list and say, oh yes, I would love to see that topic talked about, uh, we can also do that. Um, I won't necessarily run the whole slideshow since that's not really how the live stream works, but uh, but I could at least talk about the topics. So, but that's that's lots of ideas. So we'll we'll do some more show and tell. We'll do some wig ventilating. We'll do some prop making. Uh, we will do talking about how competition works and that sort of thing. Um, and I don't know. I can I can discuss with Laura and see how her setup is going for next week, and maybe we can arrange to do a joint uh, joint chat on that. And that way, while I'm ventilating a wig, which is again about as exciting as watching paint dry, um, then we can be talking about other topics. Oh, panel of cosplayers to discuss competition. Well, yeah, we could do that too. I guess that that also works. Um, yeah, I need I need to uh, get set up to host a variety show type thing. I know Laura's got that on her stream where she has a lot of guests come in. I don't currently have any of my templates set up for that, so I will need to do some prep work before we have more than one person come in and talk. But uh, but yeah, we could totally have a panel of cosplayers. Um, what week do you have Emmy on your stream? Is that two weeks from now? Maybe? Um, I mean, Laura, Laura just said on her stream. I think it was two weeks from now. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of local cosplay friends who could certainly talk about that. And we have a lot of friends who are judges too. So, you know, if there's interest in what do the judges look for in a costume? I've done two panels this fall or this fall, last fall in November and December, respectively. I did panels in both of those months um, that were judge panels talking about, hey, what are you looking for when a cosplayer walks into the room to be judged? How does that work? What are you looking for? What do you score things on? You know, what what are your criteria? Um, what should cosplayers tell you about their costumes? That sort of thing. So, uh, so that would be another thing we could do. Um, two weeks out. So yeah, Laura will have Emmy, and I don't know. I will have to ask Emmy if she's even available for longer than the time frame of Laura's uh, stream. But Emmy is another one who would be really good to talk about with that. But but yeah, we have we have lots of options. So, all right. Well, that gives me some things to work on, and all of that is contingent on my materials arriving. Please deliver my materials soon. Um, but you know, even if they don't, we can we can do some talking head type stuff. And honestly, if my materials aren't here by next week, I'm going to start giving up hope that they'll arrive at any point in in uh, the near future, and I might just have to come up with some other things to do on my own. And honestly. It's not like I have a shortage of stuff to work on in this room. I could always just pull out one of my many works in progress and be like, hey, now's a really good time to make some progress on this work in progress. So that's an option too. Um, so it is now 9.30, which means we're at an hour and a half, which, wow, I, that is time flying. Um, so I think that's probably a good place to wrap it. But if you have any other burning questions, absolutely feel free to throw them at me uh, and let me know what you want in topics. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll try to set up some actual making stuff next week if my materials are here. And uh, we'll, we'll cover a lot of different things. So thank you all for coming and hanging out. I hope you have had an enjoyable Tuesday evening. Um, and yeah, I, I think, think I'm going to start putting stuff away now to broken out all of the uh, materials from Dirk Gently. And if you have not seen Dirk Gently, go watch it. Start with season one, though. Season two is Scissors Cowboy. Season one is actually more plot. So, all right. Thank you very much. I will see you all, well, hopefully, uh, some of you, uh, next Tuesday. And have a good week.